Co-workers of the missing pregnant woman now say Lori Hacking was visibly distraught days before she disappeared. After a phone conversation with the University of North Carolina, friends say she left work in tears, apparently learning about her husband's long-kept secret, that he never was accepted to medical school as he led family and friends to believe. In fact, he'd never apply. There's the real-life Mark, the one that couldn't go to medical school, couldn't find a way to be as successful as his brothers, that felt low self-esteem and probably very bad about himself, that he couldn't be who he wanted to be. And then the desired Mark, who was going to medical school, who loved his wife, who loved his mother-in-law, who loved his family. So as long as he could portray himself as the desired Mark, he was in fact lovable and happy and perhaps not murderous. Yeah. When that was no longer an option, that's what triggered the terror and the rage. And so in that moment of terror and rage, in order to regain back control, they become murderous. Why couldn't they have just walked away? I mean, is that zero-hour approach, you know, when, when he knew she was going to find out? My theory is she confronted him, and she had every right to be angry. She thought she was marrying somebody who was going to be a doctor, and that she's going to pack and move someplace when he's not in medical school. She's going to leave her family and her friends. So she probably, she could have said, theoretically, I'm not going with you. You're not in medical school. Who are you? And I'm going to tell everyone. Uh, they had been, Lori went with him, and they had gone there. It was in Carborough. And, and, you know, she said, Mom, this is only about three miles from campus, so he can ride his bike to class if he needs to. Dr. Hacking had given them each a credit card for gasoline during med school mm -hmm. so that he would, you know, he would pay for all their gasoline. And she told me that, how good they are, you know, to their okay. children. Had she said anything to you or indicated that there was anything wrong in this marriage? Absolutely not. Everything she ever told me was that it was happy, loving, caring relationship. Hi, welcome back to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Good evening. Yeah. Gosh, it really seems like we haven't done a podcast in a while. I know it's only been a week, but doesn't it seem like a long time? It does, but I think it's been a, a busy week. And, yeah. And there's a lot of stuff going on. And now here we are again. It seems like it was forever ago that we did this. It really does. And I thought maybe it was because we did all those Christmas ones. We were used to doing it more often for a while. Maybe. No, I don't no, know. that's not nah. it. Not it at all, really. No. Okay. Because I mean, the Christmas ones we did. <laughs> we did they, them in a burst. Yeah, and they were brief, or briefer. Yeah, some of them are like half an hour though, so they weren't yeah. that brief. Yeah, I don't know. It just seems like it's been a while. It does. Yeah, we didn't forget and miss a week, did we? No, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Today's the ninth. Yes, it is. Okay, I okay. think we're still on the same wavelength here. Okay. But, All right. But you're right. I had to think for a while. And so what did we do last? Oh, yeah. I remember now. <laughs> okay. Well, what we're doing tonight is we're doing Bed of Lies. And this is the murder of Lori Hacking. Really fascinating, creepy story, I thought. It is more than a touch creepy. Yeah. Shocking in many ways. But let me give us a little background. We'll do the beer and then we'll get into it. How's that? That's our usual demo. Let's do that. MO. Well, yeah, you, you got to throw in some five stars in there, too, right? Yeah, yeah, I'll All throw right. a few of those in, too. Okay. Okay, so on the morning of July 19th, this was back in 2004, Mark Hacking called 911 to report that his wife, Lori, was missing. He told police that his wife had left home early and that um, she was going for a run, but she hadn't returned home. So Lori was 27, and she told some family members that she was five weeks pregnant before she disappeared. The couple was planning a move to North Carolina, where Mark was to start at medical school at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Now Lori and Mark had married in 1999 in the Temple of the Bountiful. They were high school sweethearts in Mormon country, and they had a traditional Mormon wedding. The couple appeared to be happy, but suspicions arose after her disappearance as police uncovered that Mark had been lying to Lori, as well as family and friends, for years. He was weaving an elaborate fantasy life to gain approval and admiration. 
Yeah, I guess uh, Mark is probably the poster boy for how to commit a murder and get caught. Yeah, not the brightest. He made a ton of mistakes. Yeah, right. Not Which, to mention that he shouldn't have done it anyway. Well, I wasn't suggesting that he sh should have done it. I know. But uh, he, his thought processes were kind of mis messed up, and uh, he didn't do a good job of concealing the fact that he was the murderer. Not at all, no. And this is a little bit reminiscent of other cases where wives have gone missing and then the suspicions immediately turn to the husband. Yeah, who said that, you know, a woman goes missing, the first suspect is the spouse? I don't know who said that, but it's true. It seems to be, doesn't it? It does. I mean, Scott Peterson and several others, I think he's probably the most notorious with that scenario, but there certainly were many episodes of that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think if you look at the 50 or so ones that we've done, there's a lot of spouses murdering their respective spouse. Yes. And also she's pregnant, so that's another thing that we see pop up quite often. Yes. But there were some significant distinctions here, and that's what I thought made it brewery-worthy. Okay. Okay. And we'll get to that, but first let me do the five-star reviews, and you can do the beer and all that jazz. Okay? Okay. Good deal. Okay. So... Such an enjoyable podcast by Winter Warmer 89. True Crime Brewery is such a pleasure. Their coverage of beer and crimes is intriguing, interesting, and comforting. I love you too. So Winter Warmer, thank you and welcome to the brewery. I'm thinking Winter Warmer is a beer drinker. Yes. Because that's, <laughs> that's a pretty nice seasonal beer. Yeah. You did quite a few of those for the 12 beers of Christmas, right? Yes, I did. So welcome Winter Warmer. Yeah. And listen to this by Melatonia208, my very favorite true crime podcast. I do a mini dance every time I get a notification of a new episode. You humanize the stories while being researched and thorough and still funny. Thanks much, you two. Well, Melatonia, welcome to the brewery and thank you. Yeah, come sit down at the quiet end with us. <laughs> and we love it by Chris and Colette. So do you think Chris and Colette are couple, brother, sister. The couple. Do you? Sure. Okay, well their names go to w together really nicely. They do. For a couple. That's why I thought twins. If I had a boy and a girl twin, Chris and Colette, that's a nice nice well, way to name them. Doesn't have to be. Chris could be a girl. That's true. It could be two girls, Chris and Colette. But anyway. Anyway, Chris and Colette say, we love the cases you guys pick out and laugh along with you guys at some of the dumb stuff the criminals say and do. Keep it up. Well, you're going to get your ear full this time. Because he, he's an idiot, among other things. He is. Yeah. So, Chris and Colette, welcome to the brewery. Come on down. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and do your beer now? Okay. So, we're doing another Utah beer. And if we're in Utah... I'm generally going to do Winta, U-I-N-T-A, Brewing Company. They make some nice beers. They do. And I, when I think of Utah beer, I think of Winta. But we spend a lot of time in Utah. And what was that statistic I was telling you the other day about um, domestic murders in Utah? They're higher than the national average. Quite a bit, uh, though. Quite like a bit. 23% maybe I, think I it was read? 23, 25% higher than the national average. How bizarre is that? Well, there might be some theories that I won't delve into on that. Okay. I'll keep myself... Or you could delve into them. We'll see. Maybe a little bit. Okay. So what I picked for this one from Winta is a beer called Oak Jacked Imperial Pumpkin Ale. So it's a pumpkin ale, and I picked that even though it's no longer pumpkin ale season. Okay. Because we're in the winter time now, and that's a fall beer. But I don't think I've done a pumpkin beer. So pumpkin beers tend to be variable in, in terms of their presentation. Some brewers opt to add hand-cut pumpkin, which I think is the best way to do it. Others use puree or pumpkin flavoring. They tend to be spiced. And sure. the, the favorite spices are what you associate with a pumpkin pie. Ginger, nutmeg, cloves, cinnamon, allspice. They can all be in there in different proportions or just one or two in the beer. They tend to be mild beers, not very bitter, and uh, pretty malty. So this specific one, the Oak Jacked Imperial Pumpkin Ale, is a reddish-brown color with a good retention of the head. 
and it has a lot of lace. It's a pretty looking beer. I like the color, and the lacing's kind of beautiful. It has a pumpkin aroma. Well, duh. <laughs> I would okay. hope so. Yes. And some spice, and a little bit of vanilla, I think. That's from the oak that it's aged in. And it's a very pumpkin-forward taste, a little cinnamon and nutmeg, and a tint of vanilla. It's a medium-bodied beer. I particularly like this because I'm not that much into really heavily spiced beers, and I thought this was a more subtly spiced pumpkin ale. So, try it. Okay, I'll try it. You just open it up, okay? Okay, we'll go and sit on down. So we got our beer. We got our snifters. Yes. We're heading down to the quiet end. Here we go. But I noticed, in contrast to the couple recent weeks, there's a good number of people here. Yeah, but they're they're being pretty mellow. It's a mellow crowd. For now. But yeah. But you know it's coming up pretty soon. <laughs> the Bachelor? Wrong. Oh, what? Well, I guess The Bachelor is. But tonight is the national final for collegiate football. So it's the mm. Alabama Crimson Tide against the Clemson Tigers. You really think people will watch that with The Bachelor playing? Well, it depends on the clientele, obviously. <laughs> and I'm, I'm kidding. I'm, looking I'm, sure, around I'm sure it's popular. I'm seeing more males and females. Yeah. Well, even a lot of women, I'm sure. So this is a re replay of last year's collegiate championship, which Alabama won. Okay. So this year, I'm going to try to root for Clemson just because I don't want Alabama to keep winning all the time. Okay. And that's tough to do. It's tough for you to vote for them? For to Clemson, root for them? yeah, because my first job when I finished my training was at the University of South Carolina. Yes. And we absolutely loathe Clemson. Why? Just some kind of big, old rivalry? Big state rivalry. Okay. I mean, it's like where you grew up, Michigan and Michigan State hate each other, right? Well, I managed to grow up being oblivious to it, I guess. I guess oh. you have to be a sportsy person. Ask your dad. My dad will know, yeah. But... So we, we hate Clemson, but, you know, they're a good team. I'd like to see them win. Okay. So, with that said, let's go on to the well, beer. Yeah, as long as they make room for us down there, we can do our podcast. Let's but go. They will. Okay. All right. So, so let's talk about Lori Hacking. She was actually the adopted daughter of Thelma and Harold Soares, and she was born on New Year's Eve in 1976, so the bicentennial year. Yeah. Yeah, in California, where Thelma and Arald Soares brought her home at four months of age. So she had an older brother, Paul, who was also adopted when he was a baby. And the family were members of the Mormon church, so they were tithing 10% of their income to the church from way back. And Lori actually grew up in Fullerton, California, until 1987 when her parents divorced. And then Thelma and Lori ended up moving to Utah to be um, in the Mormon community where Thelma thought she'd have some support as a single mom. Sure, I can see that. But, mean, the Mormon is all about family, right? Yes, absolutely. That's a big thing. Yeah. But now Lori's father, he said he was really heartbroken when his daughter moved far away from him. Well, sure. Because she was like 10 or 11 years old. It's a pretty good hike from middle of California to Utah. Well, yeah, that would change the relationship significantly. You think, huh? But Paul, he stayed behind with his father in California. He was in his late teens, and he was soon going away on a mission, so it was just easier for him to stay with his dad instead of being uprooted. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. And, and maybe, not, not to be too sexist about this, but the males stay together and the females stay together. Okay. All right, that didn't come out too well, did I it? don't see why, but okay. <laughs> Plus, he he was an older kid. Well, that's the thing. He was in his late teens. He was going to be leaving soon, so why move to Utah, right? Mm -hmm. He wasn't going to be staying at home anyway much longer. And um, Lori was only in the fifth grade, though, so the move was pretty traumatic for her. And Lori and Thelma became really bonded, Thelma said, because it was just the two of them, and they moved to Orem, Utah, and kind of had to get settled in on their own. Now, as Lori moved through junior high and into high school, her intelligence and her really kind nature distinguished her from the rest. 
she was popular with her peers, and in ninth grade she was elected class president. So that's a pretty big deal. As a ninth grader? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Now Thelma felt that Orem was an ideal setting for Lori's youth, and they were surrounded by national parks, forests, mountains, and waterfalls. Now Lori was pretty athletic. She played baseball. And also, also, she was popular. She went to the school dances. She had two really close girlfriends, Holly and Rebecca. And they could just talk for hours about, you know, girl things. Talk about boys and fun things like that. And when she was 16, her father gave Lori a blue Volkswagen Beetle. That was just what she wanted. And her and her girlfriends would ride around town in the Beetle, listening to music and having fun. Yeah. Doing teenage girl stuff. It's good to be a teen. Yeah. A lot of times. And they had fun, but they weren't into drinking or drugs, so well, it was, you know, fairly wholesome, although I'm sure they had their share of uh, secrets from the parents. I'm sure. Yeah. But, you know, if you're a Mormon, you're not going to drink. You're not going to smoke. Well, you're not and, supposed to. Okay. That's, right? That's a good distinction. I, yeah. I'm corrected. Yeah. And uh, you're not supposed to have premarital sex. I think, no. I think the only thing allowed before marriage is kissing. Yes, I think you're right. I think I read that. Yeah. Now, Lori was really confident, and she was really eager for her independence. And she got a job at the Orem Car Wash in high school and earned some of her own money. And it was a really difficult kind of physical job, but she wasn't lazy at all. And as the daughter of a single mother, she learned the value of a dollar, and she needed to get her own spending money. So then, Mark Hacking... He was an Orem High School student one year ahead of Lori. But unlike Lori, Mark had been born into a large, prosperous Mormon family that was well-known and respected in the community. Now, he was red-headed and freckled. He had the look of this all-American kind of opie kid. And he had, That's a great description. <laughs> yeah, makes me think of, you know, Ron Howard. That's yeah. yeah. Now, he had six brothers and sisters, which wasn't all that unusual in this community because... Although polygamy had gone by the wayside due to outside social pressures, uh, Mormons were still encouraged by their faith to breed and to populate. They sure were. Have some kids. I mean, half a dozen kids in a family isn't out of the ordinary by any means. No. Now, Dr. Doug Hart mm -hmm. Hacking was Mark's dad, and he actually practiced at the Cherry Tree Office of Utah Pediatrics. So he was a pediatrician in Orem. He, he was. Yeah. It makes him famous. <laughs> well, it does make you famous around the families. I know that, you know, families in town will recognize you, right? They do. Yeah. So, kids and parents from all over Orem, they knew him, they loved him, and he was really kind and well-trusted. He was the kind of a doctor who went out of his way for his patients and for the families. So, the family was doing pretty good there in town. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he had a, a brother, I think, who was also a doctor, right? I don't know if he did. He had a couple kids who were physicians. I wouldn't be surprised if he had a brother. No, I'm talking about Mark's Yeah, Mark siblings. had one of Mark's older, older brothers was a doctor, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it was kind of expected to be, to be at least, you know, semi-successful in that family. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, he had an older brother that was a physician and another older brother who was quite successful. I don't know what his career was, but... You know, it was kind of expected to go to college and have a have a good career. Yeah, for in sure. Their family. Yeah. yeah. Especially these, of the boys. These were achievers. Yeah. So the father, Doug, had attended Brigham Young University, which is right nearby in Provo. Mm hmm I think they're all pretty much around the same area. Orem, Provo, Salt Lake City, they're all not real far apart. Not no. real far apart. No. After he graduated from BYU, he went to medical school in Wisconsin and did a residency at Columbus Children's Hospital. In Columbus, Ohio, is that In Columbus, it? Ohio. Okay. And the family lived in a big old house in Orem. Again, they're well-to-do. He's a respected physician. Yeah. I'm not sure what his wife did. Did she have a job, or was she home taking care of I kids? I think she was home taking care of all those kids. We know from that book we read that she was a, an attractive woman. Right, they kept right. mentioning that. Whoever wrote that book just had to say at least four or five times that she was attractive. Yeah, and I would just say that the book was not well written. wasn't the best book, no. no. I did learn some things but, from it, but 
It wasn't a pleasure to read. We got some factual elements from the book. Sure. But it was a tough slog to get through it. Well, since we're talking about it, what was the name of the book? Do I need to... Oh, something worse nightmare. Her her worst nightmare or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It was an okay book, but I'm not going to recommend it because I didn't really enjoy it. Anyway. So Mark, Mark was like the second or third child in the family. Third or fourth. Third or fourth. Yeah. But he had a pretty good childhood. He, he grew up hiking the trails in the mountains and near town with his friends. He was a Boy Scout. He was the class clown. Well, I think if you have red hair and freckles, you got to be the class clown, right? <laughs> I don't know if that's, that's required. I I th- I've it, never heard of that. It absolutely is. Okay. <laughs> he seemed to genuinely, genuinely like people, and he, in turn, had a need to be liked and accepted. He tended, to, although, to be somewhat clumsy and accident-prone. Yeah, yeah. And part of this is what led to his physical humor. Yeah. And it was also somewhat related, maybe, to being one of the children, one of the six children in a large family. So, you know, you got to do something to distinguish yourself there, right? Right, right. Yeah. He was often wearing hand-me-down clothes wasn't unusual for one of his shoes to fly off when he kicked the ball or ran bases because they weren't fitted for him. They were someone else's that he was wearing. And he hadn't quite grown into yet, yeah. But according to one of his friends from high school, Mark didn't seem to mind this. Any way that he could make people laugh fed his cravings for attention. Yeah, he was a bit of a comedian even in adulthood from what I saw. Class clown. Yeah. That continued. Right, right. But by the time he graduated high school, he'd become this really glib talker. He was really skilled at promoting his ideas, which could have gotten him far in life if he had chosen different paths. He could have. Yeah. But he was also, in this same time sequence, becoming very adept at lying. Yes, yes. Now, his missionary training, which he went to, it really enhanced his ability to convince the doubters. And becoming a, becoming a missionary... You know, that's not an automatic thing. You have to be interviewed to determine if you're worthy to go out in the world and represent the church. Well, yeah. And the plan is that you serve two years, and he was going to begin when he was 19, and his parents would pay for that. And he seemed to begin this work with some enthusiasm. But he really learned the hard way that Mormon missionaries don't have it easy. It's not all fun and games at all. No, they get plenty of doors slammed in their faces. Yes. I mean, it's it's a tough... Tough, tough life. Yeah. Trying to proselytize and get people to convert to Mormon. Yeah. And, you know, you have to get up early. You have to work hard. You can't be going out having fun. Well, you're not supposed to be having fun anyway. You're you're on (laughs) God's mission. Well, yeah, but I think he was expecting some fun. Well, obviously. Yeah. And so he ended up going to Winnipeg, Manitoba for his mission. But they think that when he got there, he got this taste of a different way of life. And this is when he picked up smoking cigarettes and also became a bit of a party animal. So although he dated Lori throughout high school, he never mentioned her to his fellow elders when he was on his mission. And thrust into the real world for the first time, Mark really couldn't resist all of these temptations, it seemed. And he was sent home early, which really wasn't specified why in any of the readings that I did. But it seemed like he did have sex with a girl. And he did do some drinking. Well, I think there's lots of reasons. Yeah. He, he's supposed to be partnered up with somebody mm-hmm. that he rarely partnered with. And and that's one of the basic things. You, you're there as a, a duo, and you spend pretty much every waking hour with your partner. Right. So he he did things on his own. He didn't wasn't a, a team player. Well, if his partner had seen him drinking booze and having sex with a girl... That wouldn't have gone over well either, so he probably felt like he needed to sneak away. Oh, sure. Yeah. But he he wasn't doing or wasn't following the basic tenets of the missionary. Oh, no, not at all. No. No. So I'm not sure there was one single thing that got him sent home. It was probably a combination of everything. Right. Well, he did have a couple of warnings. Yeah. And oh, sure. You're yeah. Gonna, you're going to get warned first. Yeah. And then you're going to keep doing the stuff, so you're going to get booted. 
Yeah, and I don't know how early he was sent home, but I believe he was out less than a year. And he was sent home, and this is like a really huge embarrassment to parents in that community if oh, that happens. Can you imagine that? Well, I have no idea, because I can't imagine being a Mormon. Well, yeah, that's the first thing. Right. <laughs> but still, I mean, this, this, here's a family with a respected doctor who's a pillar of the community. Right, right. And here comes your son home from his mission. Because he fucked up. Yeah. But doesn't doesn't speak well. No, but Mark really covered that up. He found this uh, pretty suitable excuse. He said that he was in a car accident in Winnipeg and had to come home. Now, there's some speculation. Did Lori know why he was sent home? Or did she just not ask? And from what I could gather, I think she did know somewhat. And she was covering for him with this whole you know, going along with his excuse that he was in an accident and that he didn't get in trouble. Because she is a smart girl. She knew that there was more to it than that. I'm, I'm sure she did. Yeah. I mean, he clearly wasn't seriously injured. If he was in a car accident and he was, you know, a minor injury, he wouldn't have to leave his mission. No. No. So I think she knew. She probably did. Yeah. So back in Utah, his relationship with Lori really became more serious once he was back. Yeah, now they had dated through high school. Yeah. And he goes away on the mission. And, and she's history. Mine's she's, on the mission. She's history. You know? Out of sight, out of he's, mind, yeah. He's looking to get laid. Sure. So, but anyway, she took him back. Yeah. And then they yeah. started dating more seriously. Yeah, but Lori began college at Weber State University in 1995. And after a year at Weber, she transferred to the big modern campus of the University of Utah. And that was overlooking Salt Lake City. So that's a big place. A huge place. Yeah. She was very studious, and she made the dean's list each semester. But she also made friends and had some good times. She flew to Atlanta and New York with her girlfriends for some short trips. Um, she was actually at Times Square on New Year's Eve with her girlfriends. Right. One year. And they didn't even get a hotel. They just went there and did the whole thing in the square. To be young. Right. You yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got to be young to do that. Boy, I can't think of anything much worse than being in <laughs> Times Square on New Year's Eve. Yeah. Well, if you're young with your friends, it's probably fun. I'm sure. Right? But this this was a really intelligent woman. Yeah. And she... A really together person, yeah, a she, sweet girl. She yeah. sounds like a wonderful person. She really does. I mean, he really hit the jackpot with her, and it's amazing that he did this. Yeah. And at that time, though, even when she's in college, Mark was really becoming a big presence in her life. She was committed to him. And if she knew the truth behind him being sent home early from the mission, uh, she didn't share that with anyone. She kind of kept his secret, which might have been the pattern further on in their relationship, I'm afraid. Or kind of covering for him. I think so. I think so, too. Because the impression I get is that she knew things weren't going great. Oh, yeah, I think so. That a lot of what he told her was complete bullshit. Yeah, and like I said, she wasn't stupid. No. No. But shortly uh, before her graduation from the University of Utah, Lori and Mark got married. And she told her friends that the marriage was just perfect. And... They knew that she believed it was perfect. I mean, they didn't think that she was covering anything up at that point. She seemed really happy. Yeah, although don't you think if you keep telling everybody how perfect your marriage is, that it's the opposite or it's less than perfect? I mean, if you have to Possibly. Keep, have to keep justifying that you have a perfect marriage, there's something wrong with it. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I hadn't really thought about that. But she said to her friends that this big klutz of a man was really smart. Um, he was going to make something of himself, probably a doctor like his father, and that they were going to have this big family with lots of babies in the Mormon tradition, which is, you know, her whole dream was to have this Mormon family with this nice guy and, you know, right? Right. Isn't that the reason? The reason for what? To get married, to have babies. Well, for lots of people. For, know, for the maybe. Mormon religion. Well, I think that's part of it, yeah. And I think, uh, and here she is, a pretty bright person, but she's also looking at her husband's going to be a doctor. Yeah. And there's a certain amount of status. Right. Unless he's a pediatrician. <laughs> <laughs> then you lose all that. 
<laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right. No. Yeah, I think so. And she, you know, she certainly was going to be successful. She may not have worked after she was going to have babies. Maybe that wasn't the plan, but she was certainly educated. And yeah, well, and she was Successful in her own right, she, absolutely. She worked at Wells Fargo, and she was training to be a trader. Well, she was the main support, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because, oh, you're going to talk about it, but he, after his alleged graduation from the University of Utah, yeah, he held down menial jobs. Well, yeah. He was a, a psych assistant, like a nurse's aide like in a psych in, hospital. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty low-level stuff. Sure. But if he was indeed going to med school, it would make sense to do a job like that, even if there's not a lot of money in it, right? It would. Like his preparation. Uh, although, here's a guy that supposedly graduated from college. He could have had a better job, a better paying job than an orderly. Probably. Yeah. No... She met Mark when she was a sophomore in high school. And when they met, they were on a camping trip at Lake Powell. So she made the trip with a group of friends, and um, she didn't really pay much attention to this chunky, red-headed kid, Mark, until he stuck his hands in the campfire to turn a log and burned himself. Yeah. This is part of the klutziness. That's very klutzy. Yeah. Oh, I think I'll just touch this hot log. Just turn it with my hand. And, yeah. Yeah. So, but Lori was really kind and a real take charge kind of girl. So she gave him first aid and they ended up sitting up all night talking. And she called her mom the next day and said, hey, I met this boy and seemed excited about him. So after they got married, they honeymooned in Las Vegas of all places. Whoa, Sin City. I know, right? I don't know. Why do you do that? Close by. (laughs) That's true. And then they settled into Mark's two-bedroom apartment on Lincoln Street. And the floor plan there was really basic, like a million other apartments. When you entered, there was this small kitchen with a bar that kind of opened up into the living room. And on the opposite wall, there were two doors. They had the two bedrooms there with a little bathroom in between the two bedrooms. So your kind of standard two-bedroom starter apartment. Yeah. So she moved in there with him. And they had pictures on the living room walls. They had a TV on a stand and a small little table there with Mark's Nintendo because playing Nintendo was one of his favorite pastimes. And I don't know if it was a Nintendo 64, probably a Wii because we're talking 2000. We're in around 2000. Yeah, it must have been a Wii. I got married in 99. Yeah. Yeah. So it was. It must have been. And, and how he was what? 21? 22? Oh, I think he was older than that. I mean, when he killed her, he was in his late 20s. Yeah. I guess that's still the age when you're really playing games and stuff. I guess. I mean, to me, it shows a little bit of immaturity, but, I mean, some people do, sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. If, if you were 30s, I'd say, whoa, wait a minute. But yeah. Uh, early, mid-20s? There's nothing wrong with it. No. No. So they had this sofa and recliner and love seat that Lori had inherited from a former roommate. And they had lots of family photos scattered around from both Mark's big family and Lori's smaller one because they both were really close to their families. But Mark really loved the outdoors, Lori a little bit more of a homebody. So she'd taken up scrapbooking and she enjoyed going to the movies and restaurants with her mom and her girlfriends. And in July of 2004, Mark was working at the Psychiatric Care Center at the University of Utah. So this is where he was like a psychiatric aide. Right. This is after he's allegedly graduated college. Yes. Are you going to talk about that? Yes. Okay. So this is after he's allegedly graduated in May, planning to go to med school in the fall. Right. Yeah. So Lori was also working. She was working downtown at Wells Fargo as a trading assistant, so she had a pretty good job. I'm sure she was making more money than him. Way more. Yeah. Plus she had uh, a job, like a part-time job. At H and R Block. Well, she moonlighted there. I don't know. I don't think she was doing it at the time. She had moonlighted well, there. Well, not originally, but she was because yeah, she was. they never had enough money. Oh, well, I never so, really saw it that way. But you're probably right. No, there was probably some financial stress. There, there was definite financial stress because you know, again, she had a pretty good job at Wells Fargo. Right. But he had a really low level job, making pretty much minimum wage. 
Probably, yeah. And she needed to find a little part-time work to help meet payments. Yeah. And they were both still really involved with the Mormon church as well. She was active in the Relief Society. Um, she was quite busy. And he seemed busy going to school and working, but we'll find out he wasn't really. No. Right? So on July 15th of that year, Lori told her friend Holly that she was five weeks pregnant. And this was something the couple had been trying for. She was really happy. And they were planning this move to North Carolina in August so that Mark could start med school that fall. So to all appearances, life was really going great, and their marriage was a happy one. But while Lori was at work on Friday the 16th, she discovered something. She discovered that Mark had been lying to her. So she called the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill to check on housing and financial aid status, and she was told that Mark hadn't been accepted to the medical school. In fact, he hadn't, hadn't even applied. And she was really upset, and she left work in tears that day. I would think she'd be more than upset. Yeah. Although, why do you wait until a short time before you're going to leave? I mean, if you're trying to find housing... They had housing. And you're trying to find financial aid, or apply for financial aid. And it seems like it's late in the game to do that. Well, you know what? He was telling her this was all taken care of. And the way I look at it, she was checking on things because she obviously had some concerns and some suspicions, I, don't you think? Yeah. yeah. Now, now that you put it that way, yeah. I, I think so. That she's probably caught him in enough lies that she's going to check to make yeah, sure. I think You're so. You're right. I think so. I mean, she's wanting to believe him. There might be a, a bit of denial, but, you know, it's getting close and she's going to confirm things that yeah. he's telling her. Right. And then, obviously, they come out not being true. I'm sure she's just really upset. So, on July 18th, the couple attended a party, and everything seemed fine between them there. Actually, some people said that she was a little happier, and he seemed a little more quiet and reclusive at the party. Yeah, because so he's I wonder, been found out. Yeah, and maybe she was, like, ready to be done with him. Well... That could be. I mean, that's that's what got her killed. I mean, some people said maybe he lied to her and she was believing that, and that's why she was cheerful, but I think she was too smart for that. No, but he did try to cover the lie with another lie. Well, I mean, that's that, what he always did. That everything was all set. It was a computer error. Yeah, but she actually had called, which we'll get to. So that, that didn't fly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that sounds kind of familiar. It does. To hear about husbands lying to their wives. Yeah. And remember the, the doctor we hired a few years ago? Oh, yeah, yeah. Her, I totally thought of him. Right? Mm -hmm. Her husband had gone to medical school. He was an attorney who never practiced law, and he decided he wanted to go to medical school. Well, yeah, so this was a female doctor that came so, to work with you, so and it was her husband. Her husband had spent a year apart from her, allegedly going to medical school. Right. And then she uprooted the family and moved to this area. Yeah, they had a couple couple daughters. A couple daughters. Yeah. And uh, he was going to continue his training in medical school. And she hadn't been here that long when rolled around to be time to start the second year of medical school. And he dropped out. Yeah, and when you asked why, she said because of finances, which didn't make right. any sense. No. No. So you, you, it turns out that he never went there. Well, yeah. So I don't know what he was doing here for a year. I don't know, but, you know, he was just kind of a leech. He was. When we'd go out to dinner, he would, like, order a bunch of stuff and then not offer to pay. And yeah, was... he wasn't our favorite. <laughs> no, but, we didn't like him. But I'm like reminded, when, when I look at Mark and, and the lies and stories he told yeah. to look good. I'm reminded of this guy. Yeah, because this guy was a bit of a charmer, too, like kind of trying to be funny oh, yeah. and really outgoing. Yeah, he was. Yeah, I totally could see that. So after, see some similarities, yeah. After this brief digression. <laughs> so the, the party ended, and apparently Lori confronted Mark about his lies. She had kept the secret of troubles in their marriage for a long time, covering up the fact that Mark was a pathological liar. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. 
She told a couple of friends over the last couple years that her marriage was troubled, but for the most part she maintained the facade of a perfect marriage, perfect Mormon marriage. Well, yeah. This seemed to be the last straw, though. She quit her job. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're going to be moving across country to North Carolina. So she quit her job that she really liked, going to move across the country for her husband, only to find out it's all a lie. I can't imagine that. Just think of the embarrassment, the humiliation, no. the disappointment. I mean, just so many emotions. Can you believe it? No, I can't imagine. So they're going to have a baby together. Lori told Mark that their child would likely grow up without a father in the house. Whoa. Now, see, these things are a bit of speculation as to what she told him. Some of the right. things he said, it's hard to be sure that she said the things he said that she yeah, did. Yeah, because we're getting kind of third-hand information. Yeah, here. but I could definitely theorize that she had said things like that to him. Yeah. Yeah. But this is likely from interviews with Mark saying this is what she said to me. Yeah, probably. So, but, you know, one of the greatest strengths of Mormonism is their belief in the foundation of family. It's a big, and big thing, yeah. Big. And Mark was in the process of destroying that. Right. Which was pretty devastating for her. Yeah. Well, I think religion aside, just to find out the depths that your husband's gone to. Right. To deceive you. Yeah. I mean, holy cow. Well, I could take that a step further and think of a woman who comes from a, a broken home, you know, from living with a single mom. And she thinks she's found this guy with this family that's together and loving. And she thinks that she's moving into that kind of a life with more stability. Right. And then it's like a big slap in the face to have that taken away. Wow. Well, you know? No kidding. Yeah. So she probably told Mark that she wasn't going to cover up for him anymore, I think. And that his family and hers would find out is what he was thinking. She was sick of his lies. Um, she couldn't trust him. And I could see Mark trying to smooth it over by saying that uh, it was a computer glitch, which some people had said that he said. Yeah. But she knew better than that, I totally think. She's not going to believe that after this. Well, not after the big lie. No, I mean, right. Then you come up with, oh, well, there's some computer error. So sure. So everything's fine. Yeah. She's not going to buy that. No. So between 9 and 9.30 p.m. that night, they went to this local Maverick convenience store to get something to drink. And when they returned, Lori went into the bedroom. She wrote a letter to Mark before she went to sleep. And in this letter, she had told him that she needed, that he needed to change. And the letter said that she was thinking of divorcing him, that she knew he hadn't completed his undergraduate degree, so she might have done a little more investigating there. Mm -hmm. And that he'd lied about graduating with honors in May. So he hadn't taken any classes in two years, although he'd been pretending to go to school. Yeah. Um, meeting her for lunch on campus. Yeah. Having his mother-in-law help him write papers. Yeah. I mean, a huge... Text, textbooks for yeah. his classes. Right. I mean, this, this is an elaborate lie. Absolutely. That he's worked. Yeah. And I liked his excuse for missing graduation. Yeah. What did he do? He, he was sick. He was sick to his stomach. Right. So he couldn't go. How did he get a hold of the cap and gown? Well, you can buy them. You can or, just buy them. Yeah. Yeah. So he had a cap and gown. Right. But he couldn't make the ceremony. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, of course, she must nobody, have... nobody looked up. I mean, they, they always pass out booklets at graduation. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think she probably had some of these in the back of her mind that yeah. she was suppressing. Yeah. Because something's not quite right with the whole thing. For sure. Yeah. You know, it sounds fishy. And it, it sounds really suspicious in retrospect, but it must have sounded suspicious enough at the time it happened. Yeah, I'm sure there are a lot of little things that were adding up to seem weird. Yeah. But who's going to think that someone's going to make such an elaborate story? Nobody. No. So it's thought that Mark read the letter while Lori had fallen asleep. So not only had he lied to Lori, but to his entire family. His father was actually planning to accompany them to Chapel Hill and to help them get settled in at the medical school. <laughs> it's just, okay. Yeah. So Mark felt that it was Lori's place to stand beside him, no matter what. And it was her place to just bear the burdens of childbirth, maintain a comfortable home, endure his likes and his dislikes, you know, forgive his foibles, praise his successes, 
all these things that she wasn't doing anymore. Right. Well, that's that's the perfect description or partial description of a narcissistic personality disorder, right? Yes, yeah. And and we've talked about this. And I think there's probably a disproportionate number of narcissists that murder their spouses. Sure, I think you're right. Or murder other people. Or murder other people. So Mark would later confess that he shot Lori while she was asleep. So she's asleep in bed, and he just uh, he's got this twenty two rifle standing over her, you know, becoming enraged. And in his mind, Lori had betrayed him by no longer accepting his lies. Right. So he actually was angry at her like she'd been the one doing things it, wrong it's, here. It's her it was fault. her fault. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Now, as Lori had been crying and writing the letter to him, he'd been sitting there playing Nintendo and stewing in anger. Now, I, for one, if I had an argument with my husband and he went to play Nintendo... That would piss me off to yeah. no end. I'd be even more <laughs> upset. I'd be, I'd be grabbing that remote control thing and whipping it. Yeah. Yeah, that would make me really angry. Or wrapping it around his neck and strangling him. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, maybe not that far, but that would make me angry. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, here you've had what sounds like an epic battle. Yeah, right. I mean, this, this is big stuff. And instead of doing something to try and fix it, he goes and plays a video game? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that poor woman. So, as she'd been crying and writing the letter, he's playing Nintendo, and uh, he'd always been really skilled in turning conversations his way, of course, not only with Lori, but with other people. So now, she's destroying the story that he'd worked so hard to build. Mm -hmm. He's pissed off. Yeah. How dare she? Well, she's not acting like a proper wife. Right. Right? Yeah. And in the morning, he's thinking... You know, what the hell's going to happen? She's going to talk to her mother. She's going to talk to his parents, his brothers, you know, his sister who lived right in the same apartment complex, I guess. And everyone's going to find him out. He's going to be exposed as a liar, a failure. You know, he's not good old Mark. This is not going to be good for him. No, no. So there's a a solution to all this. Yeah. (laughs) So this is what's going through his head. Yeah. I don't know how you take the step of thinking that killing her is going to fix it. That, to me, is just crazy. That Well, it absolutely is. Yeah. Plus, again, I mean, not that I condone killing people, but this just That's wasn't. That's good. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're safe for tonight, baby. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Okay. <laughs> but this just wasn't thought out. No, it wasn't, and I, mean, I, I think it's an act of rage, I guess. Yeah. But to do it while she's asleep, it's like a passive-aggressive rage. Is there such a thing? Sure. Yeah. So, but he's done it, and then he's, he's after the fact, thinking, well, shit, what do I do now? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, so he shoots her while she's asleep, and, you know, she probably died instantly, thank goodness. And so her body's lying there, bleeding onto the bed, And he's realizing, you know, he has to come up with a story, do something with her body. You know, he's really got a whole new set of problems now. He hasn't really solved it. He's added more problems. These are major problems. Much more serious problems, yeah. So I guess he was a secret smoker. And his thought then was, oh, I need a cigarette to kind of clear my mind. So he goes back to the Maverick convenience store, where he and Lori had been a few hours earlier. And there's surveillance footage from this. And he's seen... Um, asking for the cigarettes, and then when the clerk turns around to get the cigarettes, you can see Mark looking at his hands. It's kind of creepy. Have you seen this? Yeah, he's looking for blood stains or something. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. How do my hands look? Yeah. And uh, so he goes back to the apartment building. He backs up to the apartment's patio door. And when he goes inside, the pillow top on their mattress was saturated with Lori's blood. She's been lying there bleeding. Yeah. He shot her in the head. There's yeah. blood all over the place. Yeah. So he took a hunting knife and he cut the pillow top from the rest of the mattress. And then he put Lori in the pillow top in these large trash bags after changing her into jogging clothes. Then he put Lori in the pillow top and the bloody pillows and the gun into the car. And then he actually balanced the rest of the mattress on top of the car and took like a short ride to a nearby dumpster. Yeah. So, see, this is a, a, so a temporary see solution, the, right? Really bad, yeah. yeah. And he left the knife in a nightstand. Right. 
which you'll mention later. Well, he put the mattress in a dumpster behind the Ward House at the end of Lincoln Street. Right, the Ward House is the house of worship. Yeah, it's like church offices yeah. and like a, yeah. And then he drove to the psychiatric hospital where he worked, and he pulled up to the dumpster out back, and that's where he dumped Lori's body. Now, the university's psychiatric institute actually had 16 motion-sensitive closed-circuit uh, television cameras transmitting digital images into a centralized computer, and two cameras captured the image of a man carrying an obvious body wrapped in plastic and tossing it into one of the dumpsters. Yeah, but they couldn't identify Mark. They no. Could, they could just tell that it was a person. Right. But, yeah, because the image was poor quality. Yeah. But if the resolution had been better, he would have been identified easily. That would have been end of story, and he had no way of knowing that. So he didn't even think of that. Nope. He wasn't really very smart. He really wasn't. No. Then he returns to the apartment and tries to think about what he's going to do for a story. And he cleans up the hunting knife that he'd used uh, to cut the mattress. And he put it in the drawer of the bedside table. You know, not noticing that there are traces of blood and a few hairs on it. Right. So really sloppy work, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Not great. And he also didn't notice the blood in her car from hauling her around, because they only had the one car. Well, no, he had an SUV, but he took her oh, in her, in her right. car. He yeah. did. Yeah. But there were spots of blood that he didn't notice, like around the back seat where he put her body. Yeah. Right. And there's some more stupidity in terms of where he left the car, and he left the seat way back, so it was... And she was a smallish woman, and he's a t tall guy. So it was obvious that she couldn't have been driving the car. Right, right. But anyway. Lots of stuff. Lots of stuff. Lori had often run at City Creek Canyon, which is a park near their apartment building. Mm -hmm. Mark had the idea that if Lori went for a run and didn't return, then no one would question him. He'd just say, you know. Maybe end of story. She went out for a run early in the morning. She hasn't come back. Well, enough said. We're not going to yeah. question anybody. It's an end of the story. Lori's parents loved him, and they would accept whatever he told them as the truth. Sure. And the more he thought about it, the more he liked the idea of Lori going missing in City Creek Canyon. This is a pretty dense area, perfect place for her to come across a human or animal attacker. So at 5.30 in the morning, he parked Lori's car near the jogging path, and he walked back to Lincoln Street to his apartment. By 6, he was back in the apartment, and under the mistaken belief that he covered all his tracks. But... But not at all. Then he saw the bare box spring in the master bedroom. Whoops. He, yeah. He, now he took out the mattress and tossed that, but there's you a box spring. You didn't even think about it? Yeah. So who's, who's going to sleep on just a box spring? Well, the missing mattress was really going to be difficult to explain. For sure. So we have Chad and Lisa Downs, and they opened their store, Bradley's Sleep Shop, at 9 a.m. that day. And Mark Hacking was their first customer. He didn't appear nervous, but he was kind of awkward as he went in and he looked around the showroom, kind of waiting for someone to help him. He yeah, well, I can be awkward. I mean, guys don't go and buy mattresses. Well, sure. Maybe couples do, but... We always take the lead from our wives. Okay. Well. So I can see where he'd be a little awkward. Yeah. Besides I mean, it the didn't fact seem that strange. he's just killed his wife. Right. I mean, he, he didn't seem overtly strange when he got there, I guess is my point. Right. There was nothing that really stuck out. No. The only thing is he didn't lie down on them to test any of the mattresses. That was well, a little unusual. That's... You, but no you, huge deal. You always got to lie down on them. Right? I would think so, yeah. But the sale to him, they said, was effortless. He paid $500, didn't ask many questions. He also bought these pricey pillows at $50 each. Yeah, it's really straightforward thinking on his part. And he actually used his University of Utah credit card, didn't use cash. And Chad, the owner, helped Mark tie the mattress to the top of the car. Now at 10.30 a.m., Mark uh, called Thelma at work, Lori's mom, and he told her that Lori had gone running but hadn't come home. And then after he had the mattress set up and the bed all made, he drove down to City Creek Canyon in her car. That's right. He's going right? to mount a search effort. Yeah. Well, he made calls on his cell phone, and he's really hard at work now creating this illusion that Lori had gone missing. 
He called family, friends, co-workers, and then he parked and began to look for his wife, and he's asking passers-by if they'd seen her. Now, friends of the couple began showing up at the park to help look for her, and they actually went around and knocked on doors in the neighborhood, asking if residents had seen a woman fitting Lori's description. And then it was 10.49 a.m. when Mark called 911, and he reported Lori missing. So to Sergeant Phil Esslinger, is that his name? Phil Esslinger. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, the call was kind of routine. Just another missing person who would turn up because there had been some kind of a miscommunication with a loved one. But also, he knew in the back of his mind that in a min minority of cases, missing person reports can turn into homicides. So he'd keep an eye on what was going on. He wasn't going to totally dismiss it. Right. And then it wasn't until 2.30 p.m. that the KSL radio reported that there was a jogger missing in Memory Grove in the park. And then it was around 5 o'clock that night that Mark spoke to the press. Yeah. So now we're, we're taking it seriously. Yeah, it's and been all day. She hasn't returned for 12 hours. Yeah. Where's she been? Right. Lorraine Beasley, a friend of Lori's who'd worked with Lori um, back when Lori was moonlighting at the H&R Block office, didn't learn about Lori being missing until the evening news. And Lori had told Lorraine all about the planned move to North Carolina and all about her pregnancy. So Lorraine was instantly worried, thought something was really wrong here. Yeah, these are pretty good friends. Yeah. And she called her friend Grace Hansen, who was also a friend of Lori's and had heard the news. And the strange thing is here, or the interesting thing, is that Lorraine said to Grace... Right away, even though it hadn't even been a day, she said, I think that they had a blow-up and that he did something to her. <laughs> so obviously there was something that would make her think so, that. So Things Lori weren't perfect. must have confided in her friends that stuff was going on in their marriage. Somewhat, yeah. Or they sensed it. I don't know. No, I don't think you just sensed that. I, no. I think something she said. Maybe. Well, you're not going to give me that, huh? It's possible, but you know, I sense things. Right? Well, yeah, but there's usually something to back up the sense. Yeah, but I mean, if you see this guy and you think he's kind of a phony or... I don't know. Yeah, Who knows? But that's what... It, that's my point. Sure. But okay. Lori might not have had to say anything outright. She might have just noticed it by seeing the two interact. Nah, I think she must have confided to her. These are her best friends, or at least the one of them. I don't know if they're her best friends. There's someone she worked with at H&R Block. These aren't her best friends. Well, they're good friends. Okay. Okay. Never They're mind. friends. I'm going to back down. You don't you, have to be. You, you got me here. I'm not arguing. I'm just saying we don't know. So the park filled up with people as word spread around that Lori was missing. And as Lori's co-workers were really determined and looking along this trail. And the police were already beginning at that point, though, to look at Mark. So everybody's looking around for her and the police are thinking... Look at the husband. Yeah, they you know? they probably had been there 10 minutes before they started suspecting him. Yeah. I mean, and he really wasn't putting on much of a good act there. No. No. So I think an experienced police person would be on to him um, pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so. And they have some precedent. This is a fairly close area to where Elizabeth Smart had disappeared. Remember that case? Yeah, it wasn't too long before that. A couple of years earlier, and she was abducted from her home. And uh, the foothills above Salt Lake City and above the smart home is sworn with hundreds of searching volunteers. Now, fortunately, nine months later, she was found alive. Elizabeth was. Right. So maybe this lifted hopes for the searchers that Lori would be found safe. Yeah, I could see that. However. Yes. Police went to Mark and Lori's apartment, and it was very clear immediately that something was wrong. There were small blood spatters on the floor and wall. The hunting knife was found in the nightstand with her blood and hair on it. Yeah. Or someone's blood and hair on it, because they didn't analyze it right away. And they found out about Mark's purchase of a new mattress at the mattress store because he left the receipt in his car. Sure. Duh. We used a credit card anyway, so that was going to be discovered easily. Lori's car keys were in the apartment. That was so, a big fuck up. So how is she going to drive down to <laughs> such an obvious the fuck park up. and run 
and leave yeah. her keys? She just levitate? I don't know. I mean, that's what makes me think that's really weird. And I think some um, some Mark sympathizers have thought that he wasn't really in his right mind if he did things like this. That maybe he was really stressed out and mentally mentally stressed. Well, I'm sure he's mentally stressed. Sure, but. That didn't cause him to do the stupid things he did. No. Okay. So it turns out he probably was an experienced liar, but yep. not a very experienced murderer. No. Well, he never got the chance to become experienced, so that's a good well, thing. Well, that's probably good. Very good. So on July 20th, Lori's family held a press conference, and searchers went door to door, and there were hundreds of missing posters hung around the city. And Mark had an apparent mental breakdown. He was found wandering around a motel parking lot naked, except for sandals, and he was screaming incoherently. And then he was admitted to the University of Utah Psychiatric Unit for observation, and he was put on suicide watch. So this very well may have been a ploy, I think. Well, that's the idea. Yeah. Is that if he faked insanity, he could get off. Yeah. So, and also, he was able to escape questioning and kind of get away from things for a while. For a while. A for short a while. Yeah. And also, it would lay the groundwork for an insanity defense if things came to that. Yeah. Of course, if he had researched that more thoroughly, he would have found out that it rarely, if ever, works. Right. But right. it probably sounded like a good idea at the time. Well, yeah. I mean, how many options were there at that point? There probably weren't any. No. He already screwed himself, so he knows that he's going to be arrested pretty quickly. Sure. Well, police quickly discovered Mark's lies, of course. Uh, Mark had told everyone that he graduated from the University of Utah with honors in psychology that May, and that he was accepted at the med school in North Carolina for the fall. On July 22nd, Mark's dad, Dr. Douglas Hacking, told reporters that Mark had never graduated or applied to med school. So Dr. Hacking said that he thought Mark had told these elaborate lies because he felt pressured to excel academically like his older brothers. Yeah, I could probably see that. Well, I hope he didn't hold guilt about this because, really, you would no. never expect something like this to happen from pressuring someone to excel. Uh-uh. Yeah, but I, I bet he did feel some guilt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Lori's family was completely shocked by Mark's deceptions. I mean, his mother-in-law... She'd helped Mark with essays to try and get into med school. Uh, Lori and Mark had visited the North Carolina campus and reserved an apartment there. Yeah. So they'd actually gone out there and gotten an apartment. And that's just crazy. Uh, nuts. And prior to presenting Lori with his false acceptance letter to the North Carolina Med School, Mark had traveled to several colleges for interviews and stayed with family and friends around the country. Well, this is a pretty good lie. It's elaborate. Yeah, too bad he didn't take more time to figure out how to do the murder. Well, I just think all this energy could have been put into getting a degree in college instead of all this stuff. Well, of course it could have. Now, he returned from these um, interviews that he'd gone to to get into med school, supposedly, with detailed stories. Some people said, you know, he came back, he told stories about questions they asked, um, what the people looked like, um, and he actually showed some confidence that he had done well. And then he thought he was definitely getting into the North Carolina school. <laughs> <laughs> of course, he claimed afterwards that he had nothing to do with Lori's disappearance. Well, sure. And after he was exposed as a liar, people began to doubt his innocence, of course. But the police saw Mark as a person of interest from the very beginning, like you said. And as the evidence accumulated, he became their primary suspect pretty quickly. It didn't take very long for that to no, I mean, you know, least, happen. It was an easy step. Yes, yes. Because he, he did so many things wrong. Well, or, yeah. Or so many things that would implicate him. There were a lot of little things, but um, one of the policemen said before they found Lori that they were a little worried. It's a little hard to prove a murder without a body. It certainly is. I mean, there wasn't enough blood to prove that she died. There was only a small amount of blood. But he helped him out. He did. But it certainly wasn't easy. So in addition to the box spring, the knife, the cars, the police found the letter that Lori had written to Mark, and they also found some clothing with traces of blood on it. 
Now, the cut-up mattress that matched the box spring was found in the dumpster near the university hospital where Mark worked as an orderly, and a dumpster outside of a Chevron station near the hospital was taken as evidence when they found a clump of brown hair in it. There were traces of Lori's blood in the car as well, and surveillance from three locations was held in evidence as well. So we've got surveillance footage from the hospital, from the Ward House, the Mormon Church, near the park, and also from the Maverick Convenience Store. Yes. So they have footage when Lori and Mark went there earlier, so like around 9 p.m. A pretty chronological review. Yeah, if you put all this together, you get a pretty clear picture of what happened. Right. So between 9.45 a.m. and 10.25 a.m. on the 19th, that's the day she went missing, Mark had said he was searching the park for her. But then the store owners testified, and they had the credit card receipt, so it was clear that Mark had been out buying the mattress at that time to replace with the one that he'd thrown out right. with Lori's blood on it. So there goes that alibi. Yeah. So another interesting clue, on the front seat of Lori's car that was found near the park, like you had said earlier, the seat was back to fit a six-foot-tall person. And Lori was only five foot four. Yeah, it's pushed way back. So he didn't even think of so that. So she couldn't have even reached the pedals. No. From where that seat was. Right. So that's curious. Plus her keys were left at the apartment anyway. So she couldn't <laughs> have been driving that car. Right. So it's becoming really clear that Mark was involved in Lori's disappearance, obviously. And then police were also convinced that she was dead. And less than a week after Lori disappeared, the police had enough evidence to put together a really likely scenario where Mark killed Lori in their apartment in the um, early morning hours of July 19th, disposing of her body in a yet unknown location. So on July 24th, Mark's brothers, Scott and Lance, went to the psychiatric ward where Mark was admitted, and they pleaded with him to tell them what had happened to Lori. And in an article by Matthew LaPlante in the Salt Lake Tribune, LaPlante wrote that the brothers gave Mark the afternoon to think about it, and when they returned that evening, Mark did confess to them that he had killed Lori. So the brothers were really involved in getting the confession. Yeah, and I guess you could kind of look at it as he did the honorable thing. Okay, you're rolling your eyes. Well, and it's just too face. little too late, I guess. I know, but I who know. cares at that point? He's but killed her. He confessed. Yes. And that makes it easier, because as, as you said, until you find a body. It's, well, that's it's, true. It's tough. It's he still circumstantial. He could have held out and made it harder on everyone. Yeah, but we'll talk about that. So, But they got a confession. The, the precise events of Lori's murder are unknown, because Mark was the only witness. Right, right. But we do know that on July 16th, Lori called the University of North Carolina Medical School to get information about financial aid. No, that was confirmed, yes. And she learned that Mark was not enrolled there. Lori's colleagues noticed that she was visibly upset and started to cry. She went home early, maybe to confront her husband. And court documents also confirm that around 5 o'clock that day, Lori called an employee at the university and left a voicemail that suggested that Mark had told her the reason why he was not enrolled was due to a computer malfunction. Yeah. Well, that got shut down pretty quickly. Sure. But it appears that Mark fabricated another story because there was no known computer malfunction and records indicated that he was never enrolled there. But maybe she did believe that because they went to that party that night and seemed to be doing okay. Or maybe she was just acting for appearance sake. Yeah, it's hard to say, really. I kind of feel like she was doing it for appearances because she was a bright girl. But you can be bright and still be in denial when you love someone and you want to believe them. Sure. So it could be either way. But then you, you had surmised earlier that maybe she was acting happier because she'd come to a decision. If she was going to leave him and start over. And get some freedom. I mean, yeah. if she'd been suffering with this kind of thing with him for a while, she might have felt a sense of relief. Yeah, so maybe she was feeling pretty good about that. Maybe. Because he was sullen, so it doesn't seem like they'd really settled things. Well, we know that. Yeah. So his lies resurfaced on July 18th. That was the day before she went missing. And he admitted to Lori that he'd lied about his education and his future plans. And that's what resulted in their argument that night. 
And according to Mark's statement, Lori went to bed after the argument and he stayed up playing the video game. And then he began to pack some boxes. He said that he came across his twenty two caliber rifle while packing. To me, I mean, he knew he had the rifle. He didn't come across it, right? No. That's bullshit. Well, that's just to sound easier for him. You know? Yeah, like, oh, he just came across it. and Yeah. No. Instead of, I'm thinking of killing her, and I found the rifle so I could do it. Which is, yeah, which is I think is definitely much more likely to be true, oh. that he went and got the gun. Yeah. Then at around uh, 1 a.m., he went into the bedroom where Lori was asleep, and that's when he shot her. Now, Mark told his brothers that after he murdered Lori, he wrapped her in the trash bags on the bloody mattress top, that he cut off the mattress and disposed of her body around 2 a.m. that morning, and he threw the gun in another dumpster. So Mark's brothers told police that Mark's confession had happened, and that he was, and then he was arrested on August 2nd. So on August 2nd, Mark was transferred from the psych hospital to the Salt Lake County Jail. And then he was officially charged with first-degree murder and also three counts of obstructing justice for all his lies and everything. Yeah. And his bail was initially set at $500,000, but then it was raised to a million dollars. It's a good number. Well. I mean, that that means that the family would have to come up with $100,000 to get him out. Right. On bail. I don't think they were going to do that. No. No, because I think they really cared about Lori. I think she was part of the family to them. Oh, she was. Yeah. No question. Yeah. So his confession led to the end of a two-week-long search for Lori mm -hmm. in terms of what was going on. But now they organized a new search for her body, which was going to take place at the Salt Lake City or Salt Lake County landfill. Yeah, so now they're not looking for a woman. They're looking for a body. They're looking for a body. Yeah. And they know, because this is the landfill for the whole area. Yeah, but they are able to narrow it down somewhat to where that day's trash was they, put. They can. Yeah. I mean, but there's... Still a large area. There's hundreds, literally, of trucks each day that come and dump stuff. Yes, it's amazing. So... I mean, you talk about... Global warming and recycling issues. This will really make you think about it. For sure. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. But as you said, they they could tell. I mean, they, they knew pretty much where he had, which dumpster had received her body. Yes. So they could look in an area. But it was a big area still. I mean, the whole landfill is like 500 acres. Wow. And, and they were looking like at a 200 by 500 foot mountain of trash overwhelming a daunting task for sure so they they thought it was going to take up to 30 days uh, and it took a little longer but they did find her remains several thousand tons of compacted garbage had to be rifled through by volunteers 30 to 40 feet deep and a backhoe had to scoop up and spread out the waste so the well yeah, it was compacted down it had to be broken up yeah so you come in and dump the trash, and then tractors compact it. Yeah. So you can dump more. Right. It was a horrible, horrible job that these people had to do. So they they get bringing this back hoe. It digs up a bunch of stuff. The volunteers that are searching go through it, see if there's anything, and then they repeat the process. Yeah. They had cadaver dogs that helped, although the stench was out otherworldly. Yeah. And it was hot. It was still summer. So the, the dogs were spending more time worrying about their feet being burned. Yeah. And, and they had too many conflicting scents. So there were police officers, firefighters, safety officials, urban search and rescue team members who helped look for her. They dressed in steel plated boots, coveralls, thick leather gloves, masks, protective eyewear, they snorted Vaseline, or not Vaseline, Vicks. Vicks, Vicks Vapo Rub. They put drops in their eyes. I mean, well, yeah, because there's also blowing dust. There's dust, there's mosquitoes. It's just heinous. There's heat. It's, I just... And people are volunteering their time to do this. Right. It's, you know, it's it's a nice comment on, on human behavior that these people did this. So the, the police still thought 
that if they didn't find the body, they still had enough evidence to go ahead with the case because he made a confession. Yeah. But they really wanted a body. Yeah, not only for the case, but for the family to have something. Yeah. Some of her remains to put to rest, because these are religious people. It's important to them. Right. Now, investigators had genetically matched Lori's blood to the blood found in her car, the blood on the couple's bed rail, headboard, and mattress, as well as blood found on the bedroom carpet and the knife, which was believed to have been used to cut up the mattress. Prosecutors had also compiled video evidence on Mark, so one surveillance video showed him entering the Maverick County County store to buy cigarettes and checking his hands and fingers and then driving away in his wife's car. And that was um, in the middle of the night. And then other video evidence included images of Mark disposing of Lori's body in the dumpster, Like we said, the quality of it, you couldn't tell it was him, but once you knew, you saw a man putting a body and you knew it was him. Yeah. So it was significant at that point. Yeah, because how many other bodies went missing? Well, none. Around that time? Zero. Zero. In that area, yes. There's also a video of him driving her car to the park, where he initially claimed that she went missing. So even if he'd done everything else right, he Mm -hmm. was seen taking the car there. So he really... Screwed up in major ways. He but, did. Yeah. But the prosecution decided to file a first-degree murder charge against him with a penalty of five years to life in prison, and they could not file a homicide charge a homicide charge to account for Lori's unborn baby because police couldn't confirm from her remains that she had, in fact, been pregnant. They did find her remains. Well, they did, but she weighed about 110 pounds in life, and they recovered about 35 pounds of remains. Yeah. So, this wasn't a pleasant, this was a horrible finding. That'd be probably even worse than doing all the searching for it, is to find 30-some pounds of remains. Ugh, awful. Because, well, I mean, like you said, they they compacted everything in the, the landfill. Right. So, decomposition... With the heat and the compaction and everything, must have been quicker. Yes, I would think so. And they, they that found would make sense. Like a quarter of her. Yeah, it's horrible. Now, Sergeant J. R. Nelson was the unfortunate one to make this gun wrenching discovery. And after sifting through the garbage by hand, he found a, a plastic bag, and dark hair came out of it when he opened it. And then he saw a human jawbone and teeth. That's when he knew he'd probably found her. And the area was enclosed then and treated as a crime scene. So investigators worked for hours after that, gathering Lori's remains, you know, because then you have to separate and make sure you get all that you can. Yes. Because this is a human being there. And other evidence they also were looking for to be used in the trial. So despite the advanced state of decomposition, they were able to identify her remains. But they never did find the rifle. No. No. And then at the end of October, Mark was arraigned. And he actually pled not guilty at the arraignment. So they thought that he was actually going to try and fight this. Yeah, but they had also the his defense attorney and the prosecutors had already worked a deal out. Yeah. And he was charged with a felony count of first degree murder as well as a second degree felony counts for the obstruction of justice charges. You know, for lying to investigators and disposing of evidence. And then it was in April of 2005 that he confessed to Lori's murder in court. In exchange for pleading guilty to this murder charge, the prosecutors dismissed the obstruction charges, which I don't know how how much that would take off the time. Nothing. Nothing. So he ended up getting six years to life for the murder of Lori. And it was originally five years to life, but for using the rifle, he got another year. So they've kind of had some strange laws there. But yeah. they did. Ch- they, there that's, were some changes as a result that's of been this. Changed. Yeah. Wasn't it called Laurie's Law or something? Mm-hmm. And he isn't eligible for parole until 2035 at this point. So 30 years minimum. Yeah. Now Laurie's parents actually ended up removing the hacking name from Laurie's gravestone, and they replaced it with Felinha. Felinha. Felinha, which is Portuguese for little daughter, and in remembrance of Lori. Thelma set up a scholarship fund in Lori's name. The fund grew to $81,000, and $50,000 of which was donated by Oprah, who interviewed Thelma in 2005, which I have part of the interview at our 
opening of this episode. So Mark announced that he was writing a book about his life with Lori and his crime, and that proceeds would go to the scholarship fund, but this has not come to fruition. And twice Mark was caught trying to sell some memorabilia, like, I don't know what, like his signature and stuff, to um, some kind of murder website. Yeah. Well, you know, there's always people that will pay for shit like that. Right. But that was stopped. I don't know if he ever sold any before he was stopped, but yeah. that was something. Plus, and, and even if he had written the book, he wasn't allowed to make any money off of it. No, no. I don't think he is talented enough to write a book. No, he'd, he'd need a helper. Yeah, I don't know if anyone in jail will help you. Probably not. No. So on March 20th of 2005, the Utah House Bill 102, which you just mentioned, known as Lori's Law, was signed into law, and this law increases the minimum penalty for a person convicted of first-degree murder in Utah to 15 years to life instead of 5 years to life. So well, that that's, seems more appropriate to that's me. That's better. I mean, 5 years, you murder somebody, you plead guilty, get the 5, and you're done. That but I don't think that, that really happens right. very often anyway, so I don't know why the well, law that's that Well, that's what his lawyer was known for. For oh, really? For plea bargaining and getting people off with a minimum sentence. And people would actually get out in five years for murder? Right. Huh. So they put an end to that. They put an end to that. So now it's at least 15, which I think is too, still too short. But anyway, he will be in for 30 before he can be eligible for parole. Right, right. right. Okay. Well, I guess that's all I've got to say about the murder of Lori Hacking, I mean, it, it's a shame. It's just, um, I would have to say it's a very senseless crime. Well, it is. Yeah. I mean... I mean, more so than even, I mean, all murders are senseless, but this one seems more so than even the usual. It yeah. does. I mean, yeah. in the simple sense, and all he has to do is say, you know, honey, I wanted to be better in your eyes, and I told all these lies. And uh, let's start over. And, you know, she seemed like she was she was willing to forgive from what I read. The letter that she wrote that night was that he needed to change. Yeah. So it's not like she wasn't even giving him a chance. She was. She was. So he's just a fucked up dickhead, to be honest. Well, huh? that's... Uh, that might be... Putting it bluntly. <laughs> but, I mean, really, she gave him every chance and was willing to give him more chances and right. he just killed her in his in her sleep. Yeah, like, he was just so overcome with like anger just a, at her. A selfish, brutal human being. Yeah. yeah. So he deserves to be where he is. He does. He should never be out. All right. Yeah, he we should took spend. Care of him. Yeah, he should spend the rest of his life in prison. So there are a few things I want to talk about. There are several ways to support True Crime Brewery. I just like to mention, and hopefully one of these will work for you. First, we have five-star reviews that are greatly appreciated, and they really help increase our audience. So if you're one of our listeners who thinks we're worth five stars but hasn't done it yet, I would encourage you to do that, because that would be really a nice gesture toward us. Yeah, and it doesn't cost you anything. Right. And also, another thing that doesn't cost you anything is our Amazon affiliate link, tigrabber.com forward slash Amazon. Now, if you do your Amazon shopping through our link, we get a small kickback from Amazon without you paying anything extra. So you're just going to shop from Amazon as you normally would. You can go to the website, tigrabber.com, and you can click on Shop Amazon and Support Tigrabber. Or you can just go directly to tigrabber.com forward slash Amazon, make your purchases as you normally would, and just by having it go through that link, we get a little bit of money to help support the podcast. Right. And as Jill said, at no additional cost. Right. And then another thing you can do is you can join Team Tie Grabber. And we've had a few people do that this week. We've had a nice upswing in that. So if you join Team Tie Grabber, you can pledge as little as $2 a month and as much as $5 a month to keep True Crime Brewery running. We have some premium episodes coming up, and these will be members-only episodes. So we'll have our regular weekly episodes, of course, like we do now. But soon there's going to be a bonus episode, I'm hoping at least once a month, um, which members will only have access to. And this will be a full-length true crime podcast like any other, but it's going to be made just for members. Right. 
It's yeah. not going to be any of this cheap shit. What would be cheap shit? You know, a five minute. Episode. Oh no, these are real episodes. These, these are going to be real, real yeah, things. Yeah, like you know how we do a Saturday episode once in a while. It's usually a, at least fifty minutes, an hour. It's like a normally normal right. length. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do one of those, but um, I'm working out some software now so that it can only members will be able to access these. See. So that'll be something to make being a member a little more special, besides just getting a little gift, which, you know, doesn't mean that much. Although they're cool. They are. What do you mean (laughs) it doesn't mean that much? Those snifters are perfect. (laughs) And, well, speaking of snifters, we also have the store on our website, which I got going this week. And if you go to tigrabber.com forward slash shop TCB, or just go to our website and click on shop the brewery, We've got a little store there now where you can get yourself a cool shirt and some other TCB stuff that's pretty cool. We've got four or five items now. We've got a couple more items we're going to add over the next couple of months. So, you know, give the store a visit. I have. Have you? Yes. All right. It looks like fun. Yeah. It's got some good stuff. I mean, the t-shirts, which are new, are super nice. They're American apparel. They're soft. They're nice fitting. They are great. Yeah. I mean, they're not like the super thin shirts, but they're not the stiff ones either. They're just a really comfortable t-shirt. Yeah. And I wear a lot of t-shirts, so I can appreciate it. All right. I mean, they're, if they're I could, I'd shirts. live in t-shirts. Well, t-shirts and hoodies, that's all you yeah. need. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any news on your beer review contest? Beer Have review you made any contest. decisions? I'm nearing a decision. Well, it's, it's about time. It's going to be made this week, and I'm going to announce the winner next Next, next week. episode? All next right. Next episode. Okay. And, and we're going to play the review, right? Yeah, the winner gets played. Okay. And then what do they win? Well, you keep adding things. I haven't added anything recently. So what do they get? A snifter and a coaster and a sticker and a t-shirt? Well, the t-shirt was the first thing, so they definitely win a t-shirt. Did we say a sticker? All right. T-shirt, snifter, and... We might as well give them... We've got the four items. We might as well give them one of each. All right. You're going to do that. Yeah. Wow. So you'll be like, so so true crime brewery styling. Yeah. Whoever wins is going to be the cool kid on the street. For sure. <laughs> but we're going to get that next week. Yeah. Yeah. And I really like the idea you had last week about having a contest in the future where we fly somebody out here to hang out at the quiet end. That's really neat. Well, that's going to be in the works for a while. Yeah. But I think that's a great thing to aspire to. I like that idea. Yeah. Well, and how would they win that? Well, I haven't gotten that detail yet. Oh, okay. Out, but yeah, they'd have to do something pretty special. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But that would just be so much fun to actually meet a listener and hang out with them. Yeah. Maybe we could do a little video and or audio and post sure. it on YouTube or, or, or something. Or maybe they could help do the broadcast. Well, absolutely, yeah. Right. I would think they would, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, so I guess we're done for the week, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. We'll see you at the quiet end. Yep, bye-bye. Bye, guys.